Good morning. How we doing? There's a great question that I think many of you may have after coming back to church after Easter Sunday. What now? Easter was great. Easter Sunday is exciting. Got all on our pastels, right? Looking good. Even probably some of y'all had a pastel mask on, you know, color coordinating. What now? Is, is the Christian life now just like being a person of faith and trying to be a good person and trying to be better and coming to church and bumping elbows or shaking hands or whatever it is that we do? Is that what it is? I think uh, if you, you look at the video we just saw, there's this idea of continuity. There's this idea of movement, the church progressing forward, going into all the earth, going, going through time and, and, and kind of this uh, ongoing movement. And does that ongoing movement then mean, is the purpose of the church just to get dressed up and talk about something that happened 2,000 years ago? What is the purpose of the church? What is our purpose? We're starting a new series. We're starting a new series today on the church, this movement uh, that Jesus Christ started when he was raised from the dead, this movement, the work of God's people. And I think it's fair to ask the question, what is our purpose? What are we doing here? I think everybody wants to know their purpose. I think you want to know your purpose. I think some of us here today don't know what they're doing here in life. We have no clue. And 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 when I think of that, I kind of identify with that. Sometimes I wonder, what am I doing here? What am I even, how am I even spending my time? But I think today, if we find our purpose in the church, if we find out what the church's purpose is, and we're a part of the church, we might actually figure out what in the world we're supposed to be doing here. Now, if I were to ask you what is the purpose of the church, probably those of you that have been around for a long time, especially if you've been a Baptist church, you probably would shoot your hand up and be like, make disciples. That's the purpose of the church. You are wrong. Sorry. It's harsh. Apologize. The purpose of the church is the same as the purpose of God's people. The purpose of God's people is to give God glory in everything that we do. We do that by making disciples. Anybody drink Coke, Coca-Cola? Not Pepsi, right? Because that's evil. My dad worked for Coke forever. So like big Coke family from Atlanta. This is Coke's mission statement. Refresh the world, inspire moments of optimism and happiness, create value and make a difference. Putting a carbonated beverage in somebody's hand is nowhere in that mission statement. (laughs) And so similarly with the church. The church's goal is not to make disciples. It's not our purpose. Our purpose is to give God glory in everything that we do. And one of the chief ways that we do that is by making disciples. In the same way that probably the chief way that Coca-Cola does that is by putting a lovely fizzy drink in your hand. So let's talk about today, our our purpose and what we do as disciples. So we're going to look at Acts 1.8, Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8. We're going to look at what a disciple does, when we do it, and where uh, do we do those things. And so first, what does a disciple uh, do? Verse 1 of chapter one. In the first book, O Theophilus. So this is Luke, the gospel writer Luke, writing a sequel uh, to his gospel uh, to a man named Theophilus, struggling in his faith, wants to know more about uh, what God is doing. He says, I have dealt with all that Jesus, now this is key, began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now." And so Luke's answer to the question, what do I do now? Is it just be a good person? Is no, that's not the answer. That's not what we do now. What we do now is we are disciples. We are followers of Jesus. Now, before we get into what a disciple does, I don't want you to think that a disciple is just someone that does, 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 because that sort of countermands the gospel of grace that we've heard and we've proclaimed. A disciple is not someone that just does, does, does. A disciple is someone who is. And who we are then flows into what we do. So who is a disciple? What is a disciple? A disciple is somebody whose life has been fundamentally and decisively changed by the work of Jesus Christ in their life. That's who a disciple is. 
You are no longer what you were. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And the cool thing about that is there's also this like miraculous sort of instantaneous change that takes place when you come to know Christ. But then he continues to change you and mold you and shape you. This is called sanctification to make you more like him, but also distinctly you, which is really cool. Cool thing that only God can do. You don't get to uh, believe other things. You don't get to, 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 to pick from the buffet of life and follow Jesus. Following Jesus is something that, that it, it determines, it, it requires your whole life, your whole focus, your whole personhood. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's our purpose, to give God glory in following him. Now, look at what he says here, uh, again in verse two, until the day that he was taken up, uh, sorry, no, verse one, uh, all that Jesus began to do and teach. I talked about that, began to do and teach. Now, Luke is a good writer. He's a great writer. His Greek is actually very good. It's some of the best in the New Testament. And Luke uh, has already written a, a story, right, about Jesus' uh, work. He died at the end. He was resurrected. And now we're meeting Jesus again. Well, this is the last time we're seeing Jesus throughout the gospel of Acts. There'll be a couple of snippets in between, but for the most part, the red letters in your Bible are over. So why is he saying this is what Jesus began to do and teach? It's like making a Harry Potter movie and being like, Harry Potter's like killed off, like right in the beginning. Like this isn't a Harry Potter movie. He's a wizard, by the way, in case you don't know who Harry Potter is. <laughs> Jesus is continuing to work and teach through his people. Notice it says being full of the Holy Spirit. He commands them in the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that dwells in Jesus, that, that, that uh, worked through his ministry, now works in us. And so we're empowered. So what do we do then? If this is who we are now, we're disciples, we're followers of Jesus Christ, we're gonna emulate and follow him and trust him for everything that we have. What then do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to prove. Look at verse three. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus proves that he's alive. How does he do this? He hangs out with his disciples. He eats with them. He, he, he talks with them. He appears and spends time with them. Maybe he even works with them. We don't know. But he spends 40 days with them. That's a long time. That's a month and some change. He spends some time with them. Each day, teaching and instructing and encouraging them. I don't know about you, but when I spend 40 days with another human being in the company of other people, I stop questioning whether or not they're real. Now, if I'm by myself, maybe. In fact, if I've spent 40 days with you, you even uh, uh, get promoted to no longer just being a number in my phone where I have to scroll up on my text messages to see who it is who's talking to me. I actually save your name in my phone, right? Am I the only one that does that? Someone said that I was weird in the last service, so I, I got a little self-conscious about it. They do not doubt that Jesus is alive. They have no doubt in their mind. He has proven to them beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's alive by doing all the things that living people do. He proves it. And now it's on us to prove that Jesus is alive. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, well, Travis, does that mean I have to like go like master apologetics, read the case for Christ a couple times and be able to refute the swoon theory? Because I don't know that I want to do that. I've got good news. It's not what I'm asking you to do. We prove that Jesus is alive by doing the exact same thing he did. By living. Jesus proved he was alive just by living. We can prove that Jesus is alive, that our lives have been changed by the way in which we live. The way we live is how we prove that Jesus is alive, that our lives have been changed. The church of God should be the most flourishing, creative, amazing place on earth because it's full of people who are new creations. We should be artistic and, and, and dedicated and determined. We should be uh, uh, wise. We should grow in that. And, and when we fail, when we mess up, because we will and we do, we should seek the Lord's forgiveness and offer grace and forgiveness to other people. And when broken people come, we shouldn't be like, oh, well, you're not in our group. We should be like, yes, guess what? Broken too, come on in. That is how we prove that Jesus is alive. Because if Jesus is alive, truly, think about this. If there was a man who lived 2,000 years ago who actually died and then actually came back to life and then actually went to heaven and said, I'll be back, that really ought to change the way we live. 
and it should fundamentally change the way we live. So we need to prove that Jesus is alive by the way we live, this incarnational living. We also need to preach, verse three. It says, he appeared with them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. That's pretty much his message uh, the whole time he's in ministry. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's here. I'm the king, and the kingdom of God is here. It's a continuation of John the Baptist's message. This is, this is what he's about. And so Jesus wants you to know that the kingdom of God is here. So what does that mean? The kingdom of God is present wherever things are done on earth as it's done in heaven. Wherever the gospel, wherever the, the resurrection of Jesus is proclaimed, that is where the kingdom of heaven is breaking in. It's announcing its presence. And so I know what you're thinking. You're like, Travis, you're wanting me to preach? Isn't that what, you're, isn't that what we pay you for? Like, isn't that your job? You're wanting you to preach? Are you wanting me to get all dead poet society and stand up on a desk? Get hauled down by the principal? No. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But I do want you to open your mouth. We've got to talk about what Jesus is doing in our life. We've got to talk about the good news. As we've said before, when we talked about bless, by the way, this is just bless remix, by the way, this first part. Talking about prayer, talking about listening, talking about eating, talking about serving, talking about sharing. It's exactly the same thing. When we're around other people, we need to share, we need to open our mouth, talk about what God's doing. And we shouldn't be uh, talking about what people should and shouldn't do. For too long, the church has been like this. We're like, "Mm, you shouldn't do that. Mm, You shouldn't do that. Oh, no, no. The gospel literally means good news. It's good news. So why do we not share it in a way that is good news? Why do you not talk about what God has set you free from? Talk about how you struggled with loneliness and now you're not alone because of what you found in Christ. Uh, You're not scared anymore. You're not worried anymore. You're not addicted to that thing anymore because of what Christ has done. You're full of joy and hope and perseverance because of what Christ has done in your life. Why don't we talk about that? Like, have you figured that out? Have you found that stuff by like going and seeing a therapist, which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you figured that stuff out, you tell all your friends, be like, you should see this guy I know. He really helped me out. Why are we all like, I can't talk about Jesus. And if you haven't experienced those changes, maybe you're still waiting on God to do those things. Guess what? You still get to talk about it because you'd be like, look, I still am not over my loneliness. I still feel lonely all the time. I'm not married. I don't want kids. I'm alone. But I'm trusting God to fulfill the hope that I have in him because all of his promises are yes in him. Whether that means I get married or not, I'm, I'm trusting him for what he has for me. Preach. Talk about what God's doing in your life. And then we pray. We prove, we preach, we pray. We pray. Verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, Travis, they don't pray in this passage. You're taking scripture out of context. No, I'm not. He tells them to wait. Wait. He says you need to wait. Waiting as a Christian, when we think of waiting, we think of like airport waiting. We think of like waiting room waiting. Like just, come on. Now that we've got phones, waiting is a whole lot less painful, right? Because we can just be on our phone where I'm saving your name in my, in my phone. But waiting as a Christian is an active thing. It's an involved thing. It's an engaged thing. Look at verse uh, 12. So this is after Jesus ascends. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James, not Iscariot. All these with one accord were doing what? Devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers for waiting for the disciples was praying. We're going to go pray. That's how we're going to wait. Whatever you're waiting on God to do in your life, if you are a follower of Jesus, let me tell you how you wait. You pray. If you're waiting on God to deliver you from some addiction, you pray. If you're waiting on God to bring you a significant other, you pray. If you're waiting on God to bless you with the gift of children, you pray. If you're waiting on God to do something, a job change, heal you from an illness, you pray. If you are waiting on God to do something and you are not praying, you are not waiting. You're hanging out. You're not pray- You're not waiting. We are people of prayer. And there's a reason why we're a people of prayer. Look at verse four. 
while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, which means, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, which means if you have looked at your relationship with God and you're like, there's no way. Like, I want God to love me and accept me, so I'm gonna work really hard to earn it. That's not how you become a disciple of Jesus. You become a disciple of Jesus by putting your faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. So this is why we pray. Because apart from the Spirit, we can't do anything. He's our power. He's our strength. And so we show our dependence on him when we pray. When we pray. So we gotta prove, we gotta preach, we gotta pray. And if you are like me, you sit here and you hear this and you're like, Travis, that sounds like a whole lot of stuff. And like, I'm really busy like, if you'd have gotten me this time last year, I didn't have a whole lot going on because we were all quarantined. But, like, now I'm coming back to life. Like, we're, we're, we're out of the, the tombs that are our homes, and we're, like, going out, right? When am I supposed to do this? Let's talk about this. When does a disciple do these things that we're talking about? Look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. I'm gonna stop right there before we get to the places. When are we supposed to do this? The disciples have a legitimate question here. They're like, all right, Jesus, clearly, clearly you are special. They killed you and you came back to life, which by process of elimination. I'm assuming they can't kill you again. And if they can, you're probably coming back from that too. So you're basically unstoppable at this juncture. Is now the time that we're just going to whoop everybody's tail? Roman Empire, going down. Religious leaders, going down. New York Mets, going down. (laughs) Taking them all on, right? And Jesus is like, and imagine this was like the Australian, like, yeah, nah, it's not happening. Not, not right now, not right now. It's not for you to worry about these times. My father has affixed a date for this to happen and it's not for us to worry about time. And the disciples and I are, are very similar in this regard. We are obsessed with time. I'm obsessed with time. I'm always worried about how much time I got left, when is the next thing supposed to happen. I have a clock staring me down right now being like, Travis, move it along. Also, y'all are like, Travis, move it along. Look at how many times they use an expression of time, just in these two verses. I'll read it again. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know times or seasons. The Father has fixed by his own authority. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then there's a future tense, you will be my witnesses. It's all about time. It's all about time in this passage. It's not for them, the disciples, There's no longer a question as to whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. (laughs) Came back from the dead. Pretty much clinches it for him. No, they want to know how long do we have to not be in power? How long do we have to put up with this? How long do we have to deal with all the grief that we got for the last three years? How long, O Lord? Which is a very psalm thing to say. The psalms are full of that question. How long, O Lord? And Jesus says, Don't worry about how long it's going to take. You have a job to do, and you need to be my witnesses, which means you need to go tell everybody what just happened and tell them all the time. That's when we are disciples. That's when we make disciples. We do it all the time. It is who we are. We do it all the time. Now, you may be thinking, Travis, how do I do that? Like, do I just need to quit my job, go be a monk somewhere, get the tonsure haircut, and just live that life. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Because we think of discipleship as an extracurricular. We think of discipleship as something that we do in addition to all the other things that we do. Not discipleship. Not discipleship. Anybody know what kudzu is? Right on. Carrie's got me. Kudzu. Kudzu is this vine that grows up and over and on anything. Like, it's unstoppable. It really is. It's, it's, it's the most amazing thing in the world and also the most terrifying. Uh, from Georgia, we have tons of kudzu. In, in, in. That is what, in, in, in a more positive sense, the Spirit of God is like in our lives. 
The Spirit of God plants this seed in your life, and the Spirit of God begins to grow and work and move in your life and grow in you, and he begins to infuse and imbibe everything that you're already doing. So now that like golf tournament that you play in every year, all of a sudden becomes an opportunity for discipleship. Because when you miss that putt on the ninth hole, the opportunity to not swear and throw your club now becomes an opportunity for sanctification. Your relationship with your children is no longer about producing the best possible adult you can. It's about teaching someone to follow Jesus. Everything now is a discipleship opportunity and everything is an opportunity to make disciples. Because when you don't sling that club somewhere, your friends are all of a sudden like, here he goes. And then it doesn't happen. The, the volcano doesn't erupt. And they're like, what happened to this dude? And then you get to prove and preach and pray. See, everything you're already doing, God wants to take and use to glorify himself, to fulfill that purpose in your life. And yeah, there's gonna be times where the spirit of God is going to lead you and be like, you gotta drop that. You gotta cut that out of your life. It's gotta go. Whether it's something that's addictive or sinful or something like that, or maybe it's not even something that's bad. It's just like, eh, it's time to move on from that. And the spirit of God is usually pretty clear in that. That's why we pray. That's why we spend time with the Lord so that we know when he's asking us to do those things. So don't think of discipleship, of following Jesus as something additional you do. It is what you do. Everything else is additional. Everything else is what you do uh, when you're following Christ. Your job, guess what? Extracurricular. Have fun. It's a place for God to work in your life. It's awesome. It's such a great thing to think about. So what does this look like? What does this actually look like? Well, here's some tips on, on living a life of discipleship. One, if you're too busy to follow Jesus, you're too busy. Now, I know that runs a little counter to what I just said. But there are things about following Christ where we do have to kind of look and like, I'm gonna spend time with the Lord. I wanna spend time meeting with people. I wanna come to church. I wanna do those things. I wanna be in community, whatever it is that you might, you might decide that, Lord. If you're too busy to do that, then something might need to go. Even just this week, I had something that was just kind of something enjoyable that I did, not anything bad. And I really genuinely felt like the Lord was like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta shut that down. Like just, you got way too much going on, Travis, and it's distracting you. It's hard, but it did. So if you're too busy to follow the Lord, then you're definitely too busy. Too busy to make disciples, you're too busy. If you're too isolated to follow Jesus, then you're too alone. We need to, we need to, be in community. Discipleship is not meant to do things by yourself. Remember the, the group of people we just listed off, Peter and James and all them, they go back together and they pray together as a group. We're, we need to be in community and now we're all coming back, right? We're coming back to church. Is, we've got some groups meeting on campus today, which is awesome. Praise the Lord. We've got some groups still meeting online. Awesome. Praise the Lord. You can do one or the other. Be in community. Be in community with other believers. It's critical for your growth. And then you gotta keep going. If you are too tired to follow Jesus, you need to rest. You need to rest. I have somebody very close in my life right now that's going through that right now. Following Jesus is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a sprint. Look at verse, uh, uh, let's look at verse nine. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is going to come back. He's gonna return. Just like he left, he's gonna come back. It's such an exciting thing. As followers of Jesus, it's something we should long for because that answers the question, how long, O oh Lord? Well, until he comes back or until he takes us home. But I know that being a follower of Jesus is difficult. It's hard to follow Christ in the world that we live in. So rest. Now, don't take advantage of that too much. Some of y'all have been resting for a while. But the Lord desires that we rest. The Sabbath was made for human beings. Not human beings, for the Sabbath. All right. So Travis, you told me what I'm supposed to do. Prove, preach, pray. You told me when I'm supposed to do it. Now, where am I supposed to go? Well, we answered that question as well. Complete service today. Verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Jesus tells them exactly where they're supposed to go, which is pretty much everywhere. And what's really cool about this, this uh, the way Luke is writing right now, he's laying out for you the direction the, the, the book of Acts goes. 
It starts in Jerusalem, then it moves to Judea, which is a region outside Jerusalem, then Samaria, which is another region, and then the ends of the earth. So you can follow the book of Acts through these locations. This is like his thesis statement. This is where the gospel is going to go, and then it winds up in Rome at the very end, which would be the ends of the earth. And what's cool about Rome is, is Rome is the safe, secure uh, empire, right? It, it's a really great place for transmitting the gospel. And so oftentimes when we read this, we think of this passage geographically, which is how it's meant. But we live in an era today where geography doesn't mean as much as it used to. Geography is something that's easily overcome. I can, I mean, come on, we were all in our homes for like a year and we were still able to talk, still able to meet. Zoom has become a cuss word. <laughs> and this is, the, I'm sorry, Zoom, we really appreciate you, but it's been hard. But this is, this is, this is, Geography is not a thing. So let's think about this in a different way. Let's think about this in people groups. We had a pastor that used to be here uh, that thought about it in this way, and I loved it. Uh, he says, Jerusalem is people we know. People we know. Look at verse uh, 13. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. And Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James, all with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. These are all people we know. These are characters that we met in the Gospels. And the women are probably Mary Magdalene, maybe Mary and Martha. And we're about to meet a new generation of, of believers, like Stephen and Philip, Barnabas, and a guy named Saul who becomes Paul. These are people we know. You can be disciples you can follow Jesus with people you already know, people in your home, people at your work, your friend groups, people you know. And you can make disciples of people you already know. And honestly, we could probably stop there and be quite busy for the rest of our lives making disciples of the people we already know. Those of you that are introverts are like, oh yeah, I'm good. But it doesn't stop there. We move on to a place called Judea. And these are people like us the disciples and the, the Judeans, many of them, even though they, maybe a lot of them weren't from Judea, they would have had a lot in common with the Judeans. Jewish background, they would have differed over the resurrection of Jesus, obviously. But Jewish background, same customs, same culture. These are people that are like them. We tend to gravitate towards people that are like us, right? Same language, look the same that we do, live in the same neighborhoods that we live in, work in the same fields that we work in. We gravitate towards people like us. And, and to some extent, that's okay. Because that's a place where we can make disciples. We can relate to people. The best missionaries in the world are the people that look like the people they're trying to reach. The indigenous person working on the ground. You are indigenous to a group of people that are like you. Make disciples of them. Be a disciple around them. And then we get to people in Samaria. These are people that are not like us. So if there are people that are like us, there's definitely people that are not like us. Samaritans were not like the Jews. They have a similar background, but then it diverges pretty quickly and they become very antagonistic towards each other. We live in a very fractured world right now. Groups are sort of antagonistic towards each other. There's uh, distrust, misinformation about other people's. It's a very strange time to live. It's also a very hard time to make disciples. But... We also are more aware than we've ever been that there are people that are not like us and we're more encouraged than we've ever been to cross that line, to, to engage people that are not like us. And you know what's really cool? When we start to make disciples of people that are not like us, guess what happens? In the one fundamental way that really matters, a relationship with Jesus Christ, they become exactly like us. And you know what's really cool about that? We become like them. We need people that are not like us because there are things about the experience of being a follower of Christ and a human being that I don't understand because I don't live that way. I didn't come from that background. I don't have that experience. So we need people who are not like us. If your discipleship ends at Judea, it has stopped too short. We have got to be around people that are not like us, and I encourage you to do that. And then there's the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. These are people we don't know yet. Yet. My extroverts are like, yeah, I know those. People I don't know yet. So the Roman Empire, like I said, was very secure. Roman roads were incredible. You could travel really quickly on Roman roads. And so it made the world a smaller place. And the gospel was able to spread throughout the Roman Empire really quickly because of this. We live in an era, like I said now, where 
Geography is not that big of a deal. The Roman road for us now are, is the, the information superhighway, right? The World Wide Web, media, social media. That's, that's the Roman road, and the gospel can go anywhere and everywhere. And if you don't think we're a global community, how many of us were riveted to our screens because there was a ship stuck in a canal halfway around the world? All of us are like, my toilet paper. We live in a global world. Let me ask you this. Is your faith global? If you're so aware of a ship carrying toilet paper, I don't know what it was carrying. But if you're so aware of a ship halfway around the world stuck in a canal, are you aware of what God is doing in the places that are around that canal? Are you aware of what God is doing around the world? Are you aware? Does your prayer life go to the ends of the earth? Does your financial gifts go to the ends of the earth? Do you, do you know about the people at the ends of the earth? Do you know about the, uh, the, the Yadav of India? Do you know about the Sunda of Indonesia? Do you know the Oromo of Ethiopia? I didn't until I looked them up this week. Now I've got people to pray for. Go to the ends of the earth. And if you can't go there yet, your prayers can because we have a God that works everywhere. So, hey, be a disciple. I, I hope that if you are not a follower of Jesus yet, I hope that there's been something in this that you've been like, I want that or at least want to know more, you can talk to me at Next Steps. Be over there. Love to explain a little bit better. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you are a completely new person. And God wants to continue to work and change you, which means we got work to do. Get out there. Prove by the way that you live. Preach with what you say. And be a person of prayer. Do it all the time. Do it everywhere you go. It's real simple. It's real hard. But it's real simple. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are good to us, Lord. And you're good to us because you've given us yourself. We don't need anything else. We still ask for things, and that's because you tell us to. You're a God that has given us yourself, and you've said, I want to give you more. I want to heap blessing upon blessing. And so, Lord, today, uh, this room full of people, people watching online, Lord, I know that there are needs, and I pray that you would meet those needs. I pray that you'd meet the needs of the, the person across the world right now who's, who's praying to you, maybe for the first time. And God, I pray that as, as we have heard today from your word, at this beginning, the, the inauguration of a movement, Lord God, that we would be people that are not stagnant, but that we would be people that move from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, proving and preaching and praying all the time. In your great name we pray.